with all the restrictions slowly being lifted, I've been thinking, as I'm sure we've all been thinking, about the shape of society post-Covid. More particularly, I've been thinking about the shape of the church post-Covid. Will it thrive or will it survive? Will it embrace or will it accommodate the new reality, the new normal? What chance have we of regaining what we were? And do we actually want to regain what we were a few short months ago? Or do we want instead to, as Isaac Newton put it, stand on the shoulders of giants and begin to look beyond the mere horizon and plan for a future which will not be ours? As regular viewers will know, the only form of outside exercise I get at the moment is my daily early morning walk through Friday Woods with our dogs. As a result, it's become very precious to me. I've shown you a few views in one of these taking stocks of the route we take. Now, once you've taken the same way through the woods a few times, you begin to be able, literally, to see the trees and not just the wood. Individual trees, which in former times might have just been one more component of the whole, begin to display their own characteristics, to show the marks of their growth, of their quiet and patient struggle to grow, to thrive and to reproduce. Because the authorities in charge of Friday Woods don't really manage the woodland, trees which fall are left where they lie, unless they fall in such a way as to impede the progress of army vehicles, of course, and then they're gone. But they all tell their unique story. Some stand tall and strong, apparently impervious to the vagaries of weather and season, and some have fallen and their fall has been arrested by the branches of trees close by which look for all the world like they have held out their arms to keep the stricken tree upright, or as near upright as possible. And you can sometimes see where the burden of carrying the weight of its dying neighbour has impacted the healthy tree. There's one tree which has shed a branch in such a way that that branch has been trapped in the forks of two trees either side of the path. We joke sometimes about passing through what looks like a rough doorway in the middle of the woods, and about whether on the other side we're going to find ourselves next to a snowbound lamppost and in conversation with the fawn Tumnus. So almost every part of the wood has its own character. It's marked by the composition of the soil, the topography, the variations in the undergrowth and the actions of the animals and birds which make their home there. In parenthesis, I have to say that sadly, the marks we humans make on the wood as we wend our way along the trails and pathways are rather less symbiotic or sympathetic than the actions of badgers or foxes or deer or birds of prey even. Along some of the pathways most used by humans, you'll find the detritus of casual human occupation and usage. Abandoned bottles, for example. There's one place on our walk where an abandoned glass bottle is actually embedded deep in the path. Fast food wrappings, of course, are ubiquitous, and several little plastic bags full of dog dirt. Now, I mean, what goes through the mind of someone who could be bothered to pick up their dog's product in a plastic bag, but then rather than take it home to dispose of it, think it's perfectly reasonable to leave it on the side of the path, or worse, hang it from the branch of a tree? Anyway, I digress. What I wanted to point out was something which struck me on our walk this morning. And that's the unexpected and even somewhat random ways in which nature appears to react to adversity. Well, random in human understanding, at least. And what that might teach us, we arrogant human beings. I can best illustrate it, though, not in Friday Woods, but in the man's garden. In our garden, there was an old pear tree. This wasn't just any old pear tree, though. This was a pear tree which seven years ago was to all intents and purposes dead. It had partially fallen years before and it had just been left leaning at an acute angle. It still bore fruit, some years more than others, but its fruit wasn't great when it was harvested and the way it lay was problematic in terms of convenience and safety. So in the end, when we were having the old storerooms, it was situated alongside demolished, I asked the builders to take the old pear tree down, which they did. What was left was a stump coming out of the ground at an angle of about 30 degrees. It would have cost too much to uproot the old stumps, so we just left it. Actually, the builders felled two pear trees. The other one was tall and straight, but it was included by the builders in their felling schedule before I could say no. So it was cut down too. 
Two trees, one apparently already on its last legs, the other outwardly healthy, reduced to stumps. Today, the tall healthy tree is still what it had been reduced to a few years ago, a stump. But here's a short film I made yesterday of the other one, the dead one. The one which comes out of the ground at a crazy angle. Can you believe this? It hasn't just struggled back to life, it's thrived. There are at least three potential new trunks climbing up into the sky, straight as an arrow from the broken, ivy-covered stump of the old tree. You might remember seeing my wife at Easter playing the part of Mary Magdalene in our Witnesses series, sitting beneath the blossom of this new tree. Well, that blossom has become fruit. Once again, the tree is growing vigorously and producing fruit. Not much, it's true at the moment. They're not going to keep us in, they aren't going to keep us in pairs through the winter, but they're there. Next year, we're going to have to decide which of these three potential new trunks ought to be left to keep growing and which should be pruned for the good of the whole tree. But there's no doubt this new growth from the roots of the old has reinvigorated the tree. We don't know how long it will last, but this tree has a new lease of life. There's an old Chinese proverb. It says something like, True wisdom consists in planting a tree under whose shade you do not expect to sit. I don't expect to sit in the shade of this pear tree, not least because in three years' time I retire and I leave the mats. But it makes my heart glad to think that someone will one day eat its fruit, and that in part because I allowed, for whatever ignoble reasons, an apparent no-hoper, room to thrust out some initially weak and delicate tendrils and reach up to the sun. I think I'll end the way Jesus often ends his parables. They who have ears, let them hear. Stay safe, people.